environment and health in the Americas. Uh, we are really glad to be here today. My name is Dr. Laila Tomás Androni, and I am a STEP fellow for those that don't know me. I'm a facilitator of three groups here, and I, I am working with the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research in building the transdisciplinary program and curriculum to be launched next year. And I will be the moderator for this session. So uh, at this point, I know that everyone is already uh, experts in the logistics of the course, but it's never uh, uh, too much to, to repeat that interpretation is available and you can just click in the button for interpretation in the bottom of your screen. Uh, I am Brazilian, so I won't be speaking Spanish, but I can understand Spanish if anyone needs to address me directly in the chat. Uh, so uh, before we start, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that you, all the groups should have received an email with the instructions for uh, developing the full uh, first draft of the conceptual note. So you will, you should have this draft ready of the concept note with the first part that was already delivered in the check-in week number one and complete with the, the other points remaining from uh, the methodology onwards. Uh, so you can fill out the items as you, as you can. And you can use the concept note guidelines that were sent uh, by in the email again uh, to um, help you to address those other issues. Uh, it should be ready by Tuesday, October 25th, when we will have our the beginning of our second checking week. If you have not already done so, uh, please inform your facilitators whether your team is adding new members or merging with another team so we can keep updated the, the full participant list and the teams that will be delivering the conceptual note in the end of the course. Uh, so, information about the format of next week's checking check sessions will be provided soon. Uh, you always receive the email of what is happening uh, on the next week, and this will happen also for next week. And please note that on October 25, the session will be followed by an optional 30 minutes presentation on biodiversity and food systems. So, next week on the first uh, check-in session, we'll have our normal check-in session, and then we'll have an extra 30 minutes. Uh, this is not mandatory, this is not part of the time of the course, but this will be an opportunity to get to know some specific funders that work with PAHO, uh, specifically on the connections between biodiversity and food systems. Real, we realize that this uh, uh, specific matter might be a little bit too niched for some groups, uh, and uh, can be of interest uh, for other specific groups. So feel free to join and we will love to see you there. Uh, as part of other um, side events that connected to the course, we have also the launch of the Lancet Countdown 2022 report, which will happen on October 26th. You should have received information about it also. Uh, and uh, just to reassert that those activities are extra activities that you can come if you wish to engage, but they are not part of the mandatory process of the course. And as another uh, side activity, we have the virtual meeting with the connected uh, network. Um, this network, uh, it, this this meeting, the idea of it is to have an event to introduce and connect expertise and initiate collaboration between the connected network 
and the participants of the CEH course. So this is another pool of funders that could be of interest of uh, some specific groups as well. And the Connected Network is a cluster of cooperation and research collaboration hub in the tropical Andes and the Central American region, uh, supported by and part of the Swiss uh, Universities Development and Cooperation Network program. Uh, it has a more broad membership that builds on this network of the Swedish universities and coordinated by the MRI and the Condesan and the University of Zurich. Uh, so they combine existing and new partnership in this region, the, the tropical Andes and the Central America. The research activities promoted by the Connected uh, Network are thematically focused on climate change, ecosystems, and health in view uh, of sustainable development within the framework of the United Nations Agenda 2030. So uh, those who are interested in joining, please also come. We hope that to see you there. So after this extra information, I will just pass on uh, to uh, today's um, activities. So this is week five uh, of the course. And uh, today we'll have the TD session about managing transdisciplinary teamwork. And uh, on Thursday this week, we'll have a workshop on how to explain science to a broad audience. These are the teams of uh, the sessions for today and Thursday. So um, also again, we are really keen with the, with the logistics, but it's really important to reassert that please check regularly that your microphone is muted while the session is going on. Attention, attendance will be verified uh, when you are connected. If possible, we ask that your cameras remain on during the session. This is really important for the feedback for the lecturers and speakers. And due to time constraints, only some questions will be answered in the end. So I will moderate and take a look at the questions that will keep notes during the session. And then we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. So the structure will, uh, will have, will have as usual 90 minutes. Uh, the session will begin with the case study uh, by uh, Dr. Stella Hartinger. She is a, a Peruvian epidemiologist with a master's degree in environmental health uh, from the Catea Regia University in Lima and a PhD degree in epidemiology from Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute from the University of Basel. She is the director of the Centro Latino Americano de Excelencia in Cambio Climatico y Salud and leads the Lancet Countdown Health and Climate Change in South America. So she will begin our session today and then I will uh, pass the floor on to our transdisciplinary team to address other perspectives on the building of transdisciplinary collaborations. So, so please, Stella, the floor is yours. Hola, gracias. Un ratito para. Funciona. Se ve mi pantalla. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Is that okay? Great. Thank you very much for your introduction. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. This is very interesting and has helped me reflect a lot on the work we do in global and regional Lancet countdown versions. Now I would like to tell you about uh, this experience from my perspective, from the global data. And then I'd like to tell you about what we have done to um, to uh, be where we are now with the regional Lancet. And I would like to talk about the future as well. I would like to tell you that TD teams are essential in order to conduct these studies that require several disciplines in order to, in order for things to work. 
So what is this uh, Global Lancet Initiative? Uh, in 2005, we launched the first report, which is this one you can see on the screen. Uh, after that, a report has been published annually, which uh, traces globally what is happening with climate change and how it impacts people's health. So there is this premise, there is quite uh, a broad question. How are we going to follow up on the uh, impact of climate change and health? The 2015 commission, where the uh, Lanza Gano report starts to be uh, published, where they deal with climate change and health. At that time, their aim was to find the indicators that we need to follow up on. If it's just impact indicators, if it's uh, adaptation related impacts, if we need to follow up on research indicators. And this seems to make sense in a way. And the, the, the world is progressing towards these concepts. However, Lancet and this commission went beyond this. And they decided to follow up on these three areas, of course, which we usually focus on when we talk about a global cha uh, climate change. But they also decided to address economy. They decided to talk about public policy, also about how uh, people uh, see this issue. This commission reaches two conclusions. First, anthropogenic climate change is threatening what we have been doing in the last 50 years in public health. That's one of the first conclusions. And two, this is a huge opportunity to really change the world. And this is where TD work begins. Right now, in the 2021 edition, uh, that, that's information I can address 2021 because the 2022 report is to be launched next week. Um, so last year's report. This includes uh, the collaboration of 43 Lansing Countdown partners and UN uh, associations and over 120 researchers. These include geographers, climate experts, mathematicians, physicists, experts in transport and energy, epidemiologists like myself, engineers, social scientists, accountants and health professionals, many nurses and physicians. Therefore, this is quite a, a, a wide range of people that are trying to address this issue, this idea, how climate change impacts health. To capture this, as I was saying, we have divided ourselves into five working groups. Have a look at this slide. Here we have climate change impacts, exposures and vulnerability, that's one. Two, adaptation, planning and resilience for health. Three, mitigation actions and health co-benefits for economics and finance. And five, the connection between public and political engagement, according to the current situation. We follow up on 44 indicators in five in these five areas. At the core of these areas, we have the health impacts of climate change. But as you can see, the surrounding factor is economic and political context. Many times these two elements drive the changes. So we need people that can actually understand this fully, that the impact that we will determine, you know, scientific evidence needs to be translated into a language that everyone can understand and speak. Unfortunately, and I'm being critical in this case, unfortunately, the people at the core of decision making only focus on economic issues. As we see this, and we need to find people that uh, can help us talk about science so that people understand, this means that this initiative becomes more valuable and can become what it is now. In the 2005 report, we begin to, to identify several aspects. First of all, the direct and indirect effects that we can 
identify within climate change. These indirect impacts, for instance, have to do with droughts, heat waves, uh, droughts, etc. That was 2005. Indirect effects, we will have problems with water quality, air contamination, uh, change in land use and ecological change. Finally, we have social dynamics. And the, we need to see how people will be affected by these indirect and direct impacts. For instance, age and gender, health, uh, economic status of each country and uh, people as well, social capital, uh, public health infrastructure, which is essential, especially in South America. And finally, uh, conflict and mobility. This is the most important aspect, aspect under migration, and we're still trying to fully understand it. Even seven years later, we're trying to really uh, find a, a good indicator. And what do we focus on regarding impact? Uh, health disorders, you know, mental health hasn't quite been fully addressed yet. Also malnutrition, allergies, cardiovascular disease, infectious diseases, uh, respiratory diseases. Many of these impacts on health have already become the indicators that, that I will now show you. But the good thing is that I will show you how we put them together. And this TD work can clearly be seen. So let's have a Zoom poll. Uh, Hayley, can you set it up? Thank you. So the question is, which are the benefits? How does our TD approach benefit Lancet Countdown? One, closer interaction among researchers. Two, uh, the potential to transfer methods and knowledge. Three, it focuses on complex real world situations. Four, all of the above. Okay, maybe I should wait um, to get the answers, but I'm sure that most of you have answered all of the above. Uh, it's strange that no one has chosen number one. Well, of course, one is including number four. So yes, of course, we have closer interaction among researchers. The potential to transfer methods and knowledge will address this just now. And also it focuses on real world complex situations. I think uh, global uh, climate change is the most serious situation we need to address as a society right now. Now let's go to the next part. What happens when Lancet Countdown decided to open regional centers? And what we have found is that first in Cayetano, I was one of the authors, we were the only ones who took part in the global center. So we lost sight of the region that we were participating in because large countries, England, China, they really uh, represent the large part of emissions of the problem, but that doesn't mean that our countries in South America are not going to be affected by those numbers. So, and we also started realizing that in South America, we didn't have the evidence that is available anywhere else in the world, especially in the North, about the impact of climate change. So the Lancet Countdown decided to open the this chapter and we are the regional center that has the mandate of promoting and supporting research on the in the region about the impact of climate change on health however when we started creating and coordinating this collaboration we realized that we needed to follow three large concepts that, that we set them as objectives. Uh, we had to create first, create global and uh, local capacities and to coordinate academic um, uh, 
capacities within a region, we had to promote development and communication. According to a paper uh, from Lawrence 21, uh, those are exactly the three phases that a, a transdisciplinary research has, having the ability to create a team to be able to solve a problem. In our case, it was climate change. Um, that is different and is going to have a different impact in South America. Uh, we also are going to need to co-create the solution and focus that transdisciplinary knowledge of the different authors in indicators that are consistent for the region. And we're going to need to share our information. So our three objectives work here. But we needed to start with a why. Why is South America different? Why is it different? And I'm going to go over this quickly. But why is South America different? First, we are the region that has 90% uh, of, of um, tropical forest. We have the region that has the highest carbon uh, reservation reserves in the Amazon. We have indigenous populations. We have unprecedented urban growth, and we really have in deep inequalities on social and economic issues. And we also have the largest uh, volume of glacier loss. So with our team, we realized that we had to solve all of these issues. So first we focused on identifying the researchers and institutions that wanted to work with us. We work uh, with all of these universities from the region and then two uh, who have uh, joined us from outside from the US. And we also have allies such as IAI and PAHO who help create this body of evidence. I am just uh, wanted to show you their faces. Each of the labels uh, represents a different country, Peru, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Costa Rica. We also have some uh, people from South America, from Central America joined us as well. So that it was the first part. The second part was co-designing, um, co-implementing and co-learning what we wanted to do. So we wanted to integrate methodologies and co-generate knowledge. We started by generating our concept framework. First, we needed to create a framework on how climate change impacts health in South America. And so we took uh, papers from the Lancet Countdown on South America. We had a clear roadmap to also develop not a systematic, but a scoping review and that is uh, significant uh, to be able to understand how or, or what the state of the evidence is for the impacts in the literature about adaptation, the economy, on the impact in South America. And once we have that ready, we're working on this and we're close to finishing it, we are going to validate that concept framework with experts so that they can tell us whether we are on the right path. As I was saying, we didn't start from nothing. We started with what the global Lancet countdown had done in the previous years. And we realized that, of course, we share the direct impact with the rest of the world, that the temperature is going to increase, that there's going to be significant ch changes in seasons, that there are going to be extreme events, droughts, heat waves, fires. And we also share some other things. However, uh, they're not included in those that I mentioned are the specificities of this region. 
the idea is not that that you i don't want you to read this because it's impossible but this is how we started our brainstorm because we started during the pandemic so all of this analysis all of this um, uh, development of our framework we did it via zoom and so the idea was how to connect all of those impacts that are in the middle part the adaptive strategies that are working or not and the mitigation strategies so i'm going to uh, stop here because this is something that is going to be published very soon and now i want to tell you about not what we already did but what how we were able to integrate different methodologies to create the indicators that are relevant for us i'm going to use the examples from the 2021 indicators i'm going to use examples on how the impacts on help on health feed the economic and adaptation indicators so let's start with the first the first one we have is exposure to heat waves of vulnerable people. So starting here, we already have two very different research lines. We have we need to define what is a heat wave and we need to define what is vulnerability to heat waves. So and not, not just that, the way in which uh, we define vulnerability uh, requires understanding how heat is working in cities to in the urban areas to have an impact on health. So we need to work with doctors that tell us about the stress generated by heat strokes in people with cardiovascular diseases or kidney injuries can have a very strong impact and even cause death. So we need to integrate all of that. What happens to the body, what our vulnerabilities are, and what is a heat wave? So what is a heat wave? A heat wave is defined as a period of at least two days in which temperature, the minimum and maximum temperatures are over the 95th percentile. This is what uh, people who work on climatology define. What is a vulnerable person for us for this indicator is someone who is over 65 years old, who has uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases, and who lives in an urban area because heat strokes are a lot more uh, frequent or, or strong in urban areas other than in rural areas where we can have other strategies. So this is how we create this indicator. This is, we, we see obviously that there has been an increase in 8 million days um, in the days, number of days uh, in which we have heat strokes and in the region for example in chile we have seen eight million days peep, uh, person in peru i'm sorry in chile seven million uh, days person in peru eight million days person in costa rica right eight hundred thousand so we have information from different groups within lancet this is another example and i am also going to tell you about two more this indicator is new it came up in the report uh, from last year and it intends to measure how um, the this is a proxy for mental health because we don't have a mental health indicator so we what we try to create is a proxy of how people feel during this uh, heat events and what's interesting about this indicator is how we obtain the information of how the people feel so uh, our groups or our communication group went and followed up um, the use or, or whether 
in Twitter, they found an increase in words connected to feelings during heat waves in order to be able to determine whether there was a change in information searches or behavior that could be connected to that heat event. So again, what we found and a concept that is uh, related to climate sciences is connected to communication to be able to create an indicator that at least comes close to measuring what the population feels. And what we ended up finding was that there was an increase in negative expressions in Twitter during those heat wave events from in 2022 in comparison to previous years. Another thing that was interesting is the databases where this information comes from. It's, it comes from, um, I have it in, it's in English here, sorry, I'm going to say that in English. The European Center for uh, Weather Forecasts and also from Twitter that we're taking the information to be able to do this. But now let's go to the indicator that measure costs connected to uh, heat related mortality. And this indicator pulls data from another Lancet indicator to be able to understand the number of years lost due to heat events. So it takes that data to be able to provide a measurement of the cost caused by the life losses caused by heat. So this information is combined and is expressed in the uh, even loss of GDP by country to be able to, to show what how much we're losing in money if this person uh, suffers an early death due to, to a heat event. So they are trying to put an economic value to these lives. It's a bit uh, strong or, or stark when we hear it, but perhaps it's a way to show what is happening. It's not just uh, to say, uh, oh, the people are dying, yes, but uh, we are, what they're seeing in Europe is that they're losing around 6.12 million in income. So, and this is the mortality indicator that has the data that feeds the other indicator. This is another indicator that is, I find really interesting. And I always say this because this one doesn't just feed the, the following one, but it also gives us the ability to improve or um, find a better way to tell the narrative uh, regarding adaptation. And this shows how the temperature affects, uh, temperature and humidity affect our ability to work in uh, spaces with extreme heat whether it's in agriculture, building, manufacturing spaces, because our productivity is reduced because we, we are dealing with that heat. So this calculates the number of, of hours of time that, has, that have been lost economically at the global level and by country. In Peru, for the previous country, we found that 253 million hours had been lost. And this uh, translates into a loss of money, which for countries that have low human development or, or very low human development indices, it can represent uh, four to 8% of the GDP of that country. So that is huge. So this is how we can see how those indicators uh, feed off of each other and to 
go a, a bit outside of, of the economic factors, um, there is evidence that if we increase green spaces in urban areas with simple adaptations, right now that indicator only uh, reflects green areas in urban spaces, but perhaps it could be extrapolated or increased to show what happens with temperatures in different areas. And the last indicator, I'm running out of time, um, it's because I, I just uh, have been discussed uh, heat by now, but uh, let's discuss dengue, which is endemic in a region. We have seen an increase to the suitability uh, of the climate. The climate is becoming more suitable for dengue to expand to other regions. And so what we have seen is that not only has transmission or, or the possibility of that vector moving to other areas has increased. This has to do with uh, urban development, droughts, the change of the use of soils and human migration. So how can we know how vulnerable is our population to vector-borne diseases? Well, our work team, I say work team because I'm also working with a colleague from Costa Rica who contributes to this indicator. And we tried to understand how this is affecting our populations. One is our urban development, how uh, urban is one area, and then access to different services. And again, what we have found as results is that the most vulnerable people are the ones, uh, the countries that have the, the lower human development indices and then the, the, the ones that follow. And because I only have two minutes, let's discuss the last component. How do we translate all of what we do to a communication area to disseminate the results? This is from the last year and we do three things. First, we have uh, events. Uh, the next one that we have was kindly discussed. The next week one is the global one, then there's the European one, then there's the one from China, and then we have the one from South America in January. So I will be sending you information on that. Then we do policy briefs. And the reason we do that is because we, it was not possible to have information by country. And so now uh, the countries can select the indicators with information from their own country to relate that to policy makers, to tell the story of climate change and to help guide policies with evidence. And another one, that's another one of the components. Finally, we launched the reports we have already mentioned. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Stella. This was a really comprehensive and interesting presentation. Uh, I believe that we are all going to be there at the last countdown report uh, next week. Um, it was also really interesting to see how um, the process of adapting uh, global tools to specific regional environments in the context of this specific course uh, that we are trying to build cap a capacity on responding to climate change and public health issues in the Americas is really interesting for our audience here. So thank you so much uh, for being here and also for uh, making a huge effort to uh, keep to the time. I know that you had a lot more to say. So uh, without further ado,
I would uh, pass the floor to our transdisciplinary team who will talk about uh, how to further engage with transdisciplinary collaborations and how to build spaces where those collaborations could thrive. Um, uh, you all know already our uh, transdisciplinary lecturers, but today we will we'll be, uh, we'll have the, the fortune to listen to Dr. Lily House Peters from the University, the State University of California, and Dr. Gabriel Alonso from the University of Calgary, Canada. And uh, they will also introduce a recorded video by Martin Garcia Cartagena who is the, in the University of Massey in New Zealand and due to the time difference uh, couldn't be with us live today. Thank you so much, Lily. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you so much, Stella, for an incredible presentation. Um, okay, for the sake of time today, we are going to discuss uh, managing transdisciplinary teamwork and I'm going to skip through the first um, slides with the um, learning objectives. These are available online as well as the focal areas um, just for the sake of time. And we're going to begin, uh, this was kind of content from last time that uh, we didn't have time. So we're gonna begin here with thinking about um, theory of change in transdisciplinary uh, research. And this really is, key for visioning, planning, communicating, monitoring, evaluating, and learning within teams. And what you see here is a logic model known as a results chain, um, or sometimes thought of as a theory of change. And this is really key as we begin working in transdisciplinary teams um, to have a process of visioning, and even as you'll see here, backwards planning from the impact that you want the research to have, um, and actually thinking backwards from that. And we're going to walk through um, a couple examples of this, and we can also return um, to thinking about this um, in our final session as well. But as you're thinking about your conceptual notes and the projects, um, it might be helpful to have this kind of a a logic model um, to help guide your planning and your, your thought process throughout. So this is also essential for monitoring and evaluation of project outcomes, which is going to be a focus of next session. Um, so that's another important part of this. And in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary teams, it's really important to have uh, strategic tools that help with long-term planning, such as a tool like this. So um, here we're looking at um, this chain of results from inputs at the very beginning through activities to outputs to outcomes to the actual, you know, real world impact because so much transdisciplinary research um, is not looking only to create new scientific knowledge, which of course is very important, but also ways to translate that scientific knowledge into transformative change or some kind of a positive impact um, on the ground. So really important for that um, applied, applied work. And so we're going to do here, this is a, an example here with a mangrove um, forest where you can think about a conceptual model um, where the end goal right, the impact, so looking at the green circle in the end, is overall to improve mangrove habitat. And so that's a goal that, you know, between scientists, researchers, stakeholders on the ground, policymakers has been decided in this, in this simple example. And by having that in mind, the improved mangrove habitat as the outcome, it then makes it possible, and uh, this is a very simple um, example, to think about the steps that would be necessary um, for planning the project. So in this case, um, in order to get to this impact, a desired result would be reducing harvesting of mangrove wood, mangrove trees. Um, in order to reduce that harvest, 
thinking back, um, reducing demand for the mangrove wood itself. Um, in order to reduce that demand, thinking back a step, reducing use of mangrove wood in construction. And so actually the kind of first stage would be, you know, uh, research to understand how mangrove wood could be substituted for something else. And so this is just kind of one simple um, example of moving backwards through this results chain from the impact. But I would like to show um, a few other, other examples. And so here we've created kind of a, uh, a diagram with um, a everyday kind of uh, example. Um, and you can see the inputs, activities, outputs, results, and then the impact. And here the example is, you know, wanting to live a healthier life. And so the example here says, I want to do something about living a healthier life. So that becomes the desired impact, which you see on the far side. Um, in order to do that, the outcome would be to reduce weight or lose weight. Um, and to get to that, the outputs would be eating more vegetables, doing more exercise, going back a step, the activities would be dieting or going to the gym, and then thinking about inputs, time, money, planning. And so obviously this isn't a research example, but is meant to kind of give a very simple um, daily example of how, of how this kind of a logic model or results chain uh, could be thought about. And so the next example is a little more um, kind of complex because actually is an example from a research project that myself, Gabriela and Martine um, took part in for three years. And Gabriela will speak a little bit more about our project. Um, and this was actually, we've broken it up here across two slides, but an example of how we utilize a results chain in our, pro in our project planning and visioning. Um, and this was a transdisciplinary project that included um, academic scientists, non-academic scientists and policymakers um, and, and people who worked at NGOs in order to uh, think about improved, our kind of goal at the very end, the impact that we wanted was to improve biodiversity conservation implementation at the local scale um, in our case study communities. And so we were trying to work backward, backwards from that gap. And in this project, um, which was called Incorporating Local and Traditional Knowledge Systems, New Insights for Ecosystem Services and Transdisciplinary Collaborations, our central research question was which governance modes or modalities are best suited to navigate the divergent interests incorporate local and traditional knowledge and achieve local scale biodiversity conservation. And so what we did here was um, we, be, we worked backwards and I'll show the, the next slide, but um, we came up with our different research phases. And this was very important because it provided us with time and space to sit down with our entire team and to really vision this process of what types of research inputs would be necessary in this, um, in this project, what research activities, different types of data collection, uh, data analysis, other methodologies we would be needing, other types you know, of data that maybe already existed that we'd be integrating into this project, um, what we would see as our outputs, um, and then you know, how we would actually monitor and evaluate if an impact was made. And so this provided us with the framework for really starting to work out some of these team processes. And um, in a few minutes, I'm gonna be showing kind of a cycle or a phase that teams often go through. Um, and this is important kind of part of, of that team phase when your team is really starting to plan together, work together, um, we'll talk about conflict in a moment that can come out of this, but it really strengthens the team um, to go through a process of strategic planning um, or backwards planning, and everybody can understand their role in the team um, and understand kind of how their piece is going to lead to a common goal or that impact that everybody desires um, the project to make. So it's also helpful in that way to um, for kind of managing team expectations and creating team cohesion. Um, and so in this case, 
Our first research action phase uh, was to identify the needs and knowledge required across four cases that we were working in, Colombia, Uruguay, Chile, and Canada, um, in close collaboration with our stakeholders. And in our second research stage, we were doing was designing and implementing this collaborative um, transdisciplinary research to identify barriers and enablers that were already present um, in conservation uh, governance um, in, in Latin America or throughout the Americas. Okay, and this uh, slide shows the next kind of um, stages of our phase, our, uh, phase stages. So in our research um, phase three, here we were really looking at how we were going to effectively communicate. So these were some of the outcomes of the project to com effectively communicate our research results through a range of activities with our strategic partners. Um, and you can see too, this allows you to kind of think about which stages of your project um, are going to be completed when. So this is, can be helpful for a timeline um, or once phases are completed for kind of marking those steps as you move forward, um, as well as that this is a living document that it is um, not static, it's open to change. It is likely to adapt and grow and change with the project, um, but provides that kind of ability to go back and say, you know, where are we as a team? Where are we trying to get um, as a team or through this research? And, you know, where are we in these phases? Um, so that can be very important as well. In our um, action, in our next action research stage, we also were looking at collaboratively reflecting on our research results in and across our cases and designing the strategies and guidelines that we um, were developing with policymakers and wanting to use to influence policy. So this is part of the science translation um, that's included as well. And at the end, you can see in the, the three um, green boxes, those were what we hoped would be our actual on the ground outcomes, improving local community well-being, safeguarding cultural heritage values, and enhanced biodiversity conservation in these case study areas. So kind of that's the impact and then the different stages that we hoped would um, help our research have that impact. Um, okay, we uh, now have a quick Zoom poll. Um, you can see in, in Spanish and English the text, please uh, answer that. Number one, which is the aim of creating a result change in a TV research project? One, participating in activities in a disciplined way, co-designing with every stakeholder involved in the, uh, the activities that will result in the outcomes. Three, guiding the assessment when the project is completed. And four, all of, all of the above. Okay. So I see the majority of answers um, chose all of the above. Um, and this was a bit of a trick question. So every answer is, is correct um, that the results chain or having a theory of change um, model is important, especially in transdisciplinary research that um, the correct answer is all of the, the above. And it helps to engage activities in a disciplined way. Um, it's really important for the co-design of the research and the research process with all of the actors who are involved from the scientists, policymakers, um, and stakeholders and local actors and helps to guide the assessment of the project um, as well as the monitoring and evaluation throughout. Okay, at this point, I'm gonna turn the floor to uh, Gabriela. Gracias, Lili. Buenos días, buenas tardes, ánimo. Que gusto volver Thank a you, Lili. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see you again. Thank you, Lourdes. I'm not sure. We have oh, we have Anna. We have Lourdes and Anna helping with the interpretation. Thank you. And thank you, Haley and Anwar, because they're always there uh, helping us with the chat and uh, sharing the resources. 
uh, we share with them. Uh, Dr. Hartinger's presentation was amazing. I loved how she used Twitter. I would love to know more about that and to see how that, that is really TD when you have so many tools. It's great you know, to incorporate other words, ways of being in the world or studying or experiencing these phenomena that are so essential nowadays. Something important we should uh, remember. As you know, we have been studying TD processes for many years now. So we consider that it's interesting to tell you about some outcomes free, uh, uh, outcomes uh, in 2014 when we studied teams uh, working, doing uh, inter and transdisciplinary work in the Americas. This is very important because uh, I think this distinguishes these logical framework processes, uh, these research organization processes in general, when we work with TD teams. I think that everyone here has experience in project development, in writing uh, applications for funding. But we need to remember that regardless of the outcomes, we need to focus on the process, on the on the process uh, that uh, incorporates different types of knowledge. So I would like to tell you that a few years ago, we worked on a research pro project that included these teams. One of the, our main questions was, which attributes or characteristics of the team members and of teams lead to uh, research outcomes that can, you know, create this bridge between knowledge and action. And when we say knowledge action, we mean a, 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 a more tangible impact on, on, the, on these locations. We studied 22 IED and TD projects. Uh, these were active teams, or, or maybe they had completed their project. And there was a wide range of uh, durations and funding. We had the uh, small grants programs. We also had uh, mid and long-term projects. These projects included uh, people that were in different parts of the world. They had ongoing funding as uh, something somewhere between three and five years. And they had a, a high variety of members. When I say that, I mean that these were people working um, in the field, researchers, students, graduate students, uh, stakeholders, government stakeholders, NGOs, etc. So there was a wide range of participants and also 17 countries from the Americas. Next, please. So something that we studied a lot in 2014 and was starting to be studied in 2012, but there already was literature about the elements that can be relevant for uh, study members, individual members in that are parts of teams and also teams. In TD research, we mean uh, groups of over 10 people. So we designed a framework to study on the individual collective uh, on these different levels. We looked at the cognitive dimension, the cognitive dimension and the affective dimension at the individual level with some attributes such as mental models. This model, uh, when they say uh, some vocabulary or they agree on conceptual issues, that, that is uh, reaching a shared framework for the problem that we're looking at. So mental models, including learning, incentive, motivations, and also trust-based affect-based trust. And at the collective level, we looked at teams 
and that their structure and how leadership takes place uh, within those teams. And we offered some diagrams that have already been described in team science uh, papers. Uh, so who's the leader? How is uh, how are tasks distributed? And we also gave them the option of telling us how their team works. And we presented scenarios with brief descriptions of scenarios so that they could illustrate with examples how their collective group worked. So at the individual and collective um, dimension, and then the results, one of the results that, uh, that we found determined our next uh, work in, in groups and it includes the extension knowledge, uh, uh, writing policy briefs, attending meetings, presenting videos. So we call that knowledge extension because it's uh, disseminating what your project found as a result. And knowledge application is a much higher step and it's very limited with what we have found in research. And when I did say knowledge application, I mean something that is visible, a visible impact in the field or tangible solutions from community organizing for autonomy or legitimacy in the involvement with the process that is being studied to um, participation in um, protest or rallies or writing letters to governors or, or something that is a, a lot more visible in the field. Next slide, please. And so we have uh, these three or four results that we thought were worthwhile mentioning in this context and looking at result chains. And we found that the results for knowledge extension are more likely to be reached with the teams. Um, as I said before, knowledge extension are those policy briefings and meetings that I mentioned before. So they're more likely to be reached with a top-down leadership. This is, um, of course, in transdisciplinary um, teams, we have a more horizontal kind of leadership. So there's a shared cognition, a lot of face-to-face -face interaction, joint training, team diversity, and high trust. And this is brought by previous experience, people who have been working together for a while. The results for knowledge application outcomes are more likely to be achieved by teams with team diversity and membership diversity, what we called uh, we call wearing two hats. So we have members working in, in academia, but um, they have also worked in governments or have connections to NGOs, masters or PhD students who are also members of, of local communities leadership is distributed, cognition is shared as well as in the first result, lots of personal interactions, lots of effective interactions are perhaps um, taking, uh, sharing a coffee, enjoying spending time with, with other team members and also trust from previous experience. And the other two final results are curiosity intellectual challenge and friendship are important incentives for teamwork. And something that I think is connected to this, to the result of the fact that knowledge extension is a lot more common, is institutional pressure to publish that most of us who are here are from academia and we know that there's an incentive um, to, to share. So there, there's a huge production of knowledge that doesn't uh, end up translating into a direct impact on communities. I think that was all about that. Thank you so much, Gabriela.
Um, and with our kind of last minutes before questions, um, we want to talk a little bit about what you see here, which are kind of 10 tips for a positive um, transdisciplinary or collaborative team dynamics. I mean, go through a few slides. And I think because of time, we may have to keep um, Martine's uh, grounded example. We'll begin with that next, next time where you'll see some of these um, in action. But as Gabriella was just um, speaking about, one of these really important aspects of um, a team that is, um, you know, works well together is establishing trust. Um, so that is a that is key. Um, and so as your teams are forming, or perhaps you already have your teams, but they're going through a process of kind of um, developing a new project or bringing in new members or some kind of form of change, is building and maintaining trust among members. And this is going to be, some of these are very important in the next slides we talk about what happens as teams move through conflict um, and for conflict to be productive rather than destructive, having that trust established. And also as Gabriella showed, teams with strong trust tend to be more successful as well in um, having those impacts, those transdisciplinary impacts on the ground um, and in mobilizing knowledge. Having a shared vision, and this could also uh, go back to thinking about how your team is going to strategically plan the research, but the vision can actually serve as an anchor for your team or something to return to if the team is going through a process of conflict or disagreement, um, or if they're kind of losing um, the focus on the goal is having this vision can be something that anchors your team. Also, individual self-awareness and processes of self or auto-reflection and learning are really important. And um, I'll speak a little bit more about that in a moment, but understanding yourself, how you view the world, um, the types of conceptual frameworks that you use in your research, your own epistemologies or ways of understanding the world and knowing the world, um, this can be really important because as you bring together people in an interdisciplinary setting who utilize different types of research methodologies, different forms of data, um, actually may think that different methodologies or forms of data are more or less reliable, there are, um, there are going to be conflicts. And so actually kind of understanding your own position can be extremely important for working through um, those disagreements. So that's something as well. Leadership, um, so having strong collaborative leadership, having leadership that can be also horizontal, not just very, very top down, we found to be quite helpful. Um, mentoring, so thinking about the different stages um, that your team members are at, and that can also be mentoring people who've maybe never done interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary research before. Um, or it can be mentoring younger researchers, students, um, non-academic scientists, but really thinking about how you're gonna provide kind of training and learning opportunities in the team. Um, thinking about your team dynamics, and I'm gonna talk about this kind of multi-phase, which includes this storm or the storming um, phase, which is when teams often go through a dynamic of disagreement or growing pains, um, but thinking about your team dynamic and how to keep a strong positive dynamic in your team or how to get back to a more positive dynamic. Um, communication is really vital to the functioning of a team and that's gonna be part of the focus um, next week is communication plans and thinking about how to maintain strong communications across the entire team. Um, but oftentimes communication also means being able to have difficult conversations um, that might arise. Um, and so how kind of that dynamic is going to work in ways that doesn't alienate team members, um, but allows you to have, to have those really kind of candid conversations. And that also speaks to trust built among the members um, that it kind of does not become anti antagonistic in that conversation. Sharing success. So really recognizing 
and rewarding success, both individual successes of team members and the success of the team. So that can be really important for keeping a positive dynamic and thinking about how you're going to handle disagreement. And sometimes even thinking about that before there is a disagreement. So as your team is planning the project, thinking about what are the ways that we'll handle conflict or disagreement productively so that when the conflict occurs, um, there's a plan or people have thought about how, how best to move through that. And finally, networking and relationship building is really key for collaborative teams. Thinking across the, you know, one of the great things about collaboration is it brings a lot of networks together. Um, and so thinking about how your team is um, kind of where it exists within this network and how you can utilize um, your team's network to um, help, help promote the team and your research. So this is the, um, what has been actually a model, it goes back to 1965 in early team science, but it has been built upon um, and a lot of research is still utilizing or thinking about team dynamics uh, through these stages. And it's kind of five stages of evolution from the formation of the team. So the very early stages where often might be where your team is right now, there's high excitement, everybody is still very polite, there's not been much uh, disagreement and there's very positive expectations for the team. So that is the forming stage. Um, often after the forming stage, once the work gets, gets started, you'll find a stage of storming. Um, and this can be a difficult stage, but it's really key for the success and the cohesion of the team. And this is where all of the plurality of knowledge systems starts to come together, the different methodologies. Um, and you can often get resistance or disagreement. And so working through this storming stage has been found to be extremely important for how the rest of the teamwork goes. If that goes well and the team stays um, kind of very cohesed together, or if the team um, begins to have kind of problems that, that lead to larger um, issues later. Um, then teams often move through that stage and establish norms, agreement on their shared purpose and their goals, um, and kind of have this collective vision that they are working through. Um, and then the performing stage where you have hopefully gotten to high motivation, trust, you have empathy within your team. Um, and this tends to be the really kind of effective stage of the work. Um, you're able to kind of balance all of these pieces of the team. And then the adjourning or sometimes even known as the mourning stage, which is as the teamwork may end or the project ends and moving through that, that end stage. And um, here's the last, we'll kind of end today on this slide so with time for questions, but some important conflict management strategies, because every team um, is going to go through some types of conflicts during transdisciplinary teamwork. So it's important to have a toolkit of strategies for your team. Um, maybe many of us, myself included, have worked on a team that hit conflict and never could really recover. It became too destructive to the team. And so we want to keep conflict that can actually be productive or generative rather than um, conflict that becomes negative. And so um, you don't want to get to that stage where conflict is a curse. Um, and so what we have found as a team was learning together was really key to our team's success. And this really helped us to understand the different epistemologies that and conceptual frameworks um, as well as methodological tools that each team member brought, their worldview, how they understood research, policy, on the ground, what was going on. Um, and also through these kind of deep interactions of learning together, we built trust, we built relationships, we built empathy for understanding you know, different people's worldviews. And that really helped later to move through or navigate conflict because we had times where somebody, you know, different methodological systems do not always align, you know, perfectly. And so, or different kind of worldviews. And so there are, there are um, important moments there to, to navigate and negotiate. So we had actually methods workshops just amongst our team members to share how 
each of us utilizes different kinds, qualitative, quantitative, different methodologies and data sets, um, presentations of our different theoretical positions or conceptual frameworks. Um, and that helped us then through processes of co-creating our shared vision and the rules and norms we agreed upon as a team. And finally, I'll say that our group also worked through self-reflection and group reflections um, in trying to understand and work with the plurality of, um, of the team members we brought together. And so some of the types of questions we actually asked ourselves um, were, you know, what are my own assumptions, beliefs, training, experience, and try to understand that for yourself so that you're actually able to then share that with others um, and understand that, um, you know, different, that these are very different amongst people. There's no one right way. Um, what are my own biases and preferences? This was important and came up, you know, a lot, um, sometimes in conflicts. What theoretical or conceptual framing is appropriate for the research problem, in your opinion? Um, and what tools or methods are most appropriate for the research problem? So once you understand that for yourself, then your team can actually go through phases of sharing this information um, and beginning to kind of understand where those types of conflicts um, may arise. And finally, do not just ignore tensions. Um, that's actually often where the biggest problems occur is by just kind of letting these tensions grow and grow and grow until they become um, explosive or really uh, might lead to resentments or adversarial relationships that are very difficult for the team to recover. So um, we have a final Zoom poll and then we'll turn to questions. So just maybe 30 seconds, answer the Zoom poll, and then um, we'll have Q&A. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so this is very interested. We were interesting. Um, it seems like most people here have navigated some kind of a conflict or worked with conflict management strategies. And um, I see the most popular is sharing methodologies or conceptual frameworks across disciplines, um, learning together, and then um, self-reflection and trust building exercises. So. All of these are correct um, answers, but we're curious to see uh, kind of how how our participants have, have done this. So this, um, Carlos or Lila, to turn it over to questions. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much, Lily, and thank you for the great presentation. I hope that all the audience here could have uh, seize the opportunity to take this really valuable tips of two really well experienced people that have engaged in actual transdisciplinary research projects. Uh, because um, what Lily and Gabby has shared here today are tips that only come from experience. You won't find those tips in a book. <laughs> not organized and felt in this way. So this is really important. Uh, for everybody to uh, seize the opportunity to listen really well to this experience. Uh, so we have 10 minutes for questions. As we said in the beginning, we won't be able to answer all the questions. And I'll try uh, to group the two main questions to the TD team and to Stella. Uh, and then if we have time, we can move on to a second question to each of, uh, of you. So uh, to Stella, there were a number of questions around um, the, the idea of the causes and determinants of, the, the, of mortality uh, related to heat waves. So, uh, and how do you create indicators that can evaluate this impact uh, in, in people's health? Uh, and to Lily and Gabby, um, there was a question uh, related to the role of the local communities 
in the decision making and the the result chains. So how are they were they incorporated in that sense? So Stella, please, if you could address the first question. Este, creo que la primera tenía que ver con el tema de. I think the first one had to do with how we created the uh, heat wave mortality indicator. Is that right? Okay. I think this question is, is very interesting. It's interesting that you're asking the question because you're asking about the tool's methodology. And as I start to tell you about this, uh, there's a hundred people creating these indicators. And this is not uh, my indicator. My indicator is the clean energies one. But I can tell you how we apply this methodology. I'm not sure this is relevant, but in any case, uh, we use time, uh, time series to analyze, you know, uh, heat, uh, also the exposure response aspects in order to calculate the mortality excess and to maybe analyze those deaths and attribute them to heat. So I'm not sure this is an answer we can all understand because we don't all work with time series or with uh, exposure response curves. So maybe we don't all understand this mortality excess we detect. So it's very interesting actually that you're asking about the methodology. Uh, and the second part of the question, I was trying to look it up. And the answer is no, we don't analyze specific mortality causes but we do include some mortality causes. For instance, the ones excluded from the indicator are accidents, homicides, and some other mortality issues that are not relevant for us or that are not unrelated to heat. I think that was a question, right? If that was excess mortality or not. Thank you. Great, thank you. Lily, maybe you can tell us a bit about the role of local communities. So that is an excellent question about thinking about how do members of local communities um, take part in the strategic planning or in um, the results chain uh, model. And in one example, in our work in the case study in Colombia, um, our team uh, was on the ground in Colombia and we had on our team, a member who was uh, well-respected in the community, a leader, an environmental leader in the community, um, who was part of our process kind of from the beginning um, throughout. But we also held meetings in Colombia uh, with local residents and um, interested local actors, and especially to think about what the impact, the desired impact would be that we would be working towards so that was a really um, important part of having the local community involved was really thinking through that impact because we wanted our research to have not just publish in journals and produce the scientific results, which of course is very important, but we also wanted our research to have a, um, an impact on the ground, a change in policy or change in how uh, work was happening to see this improvement. And so, we did consult with community members. Um, we had meetings with community members, and then we had somebody from our team who was kind of a trusted, and not to say that one person will represent all of the views of a community, not at all, but we did have um, a member of our team, a non-academic member, uh, who was with us throughout the entire process, who was kind of very trusted um, in the community as a representative. So. Obviously your, your team can't function with hundreds of members or a whole community on the team, but you can have local um, uh, focus groups, community meetings um, to really, especially understand what results and impacts the community helps uh, or hopes to have. And then that can help you with working kind of backwards and having some of those uh, local representatives or NGOs or environmental activists, health activists who might be a member of your team. 
Uh, this relates a lot to, to a part of what uh, Gabriela said during the presentation about the people that wear two hats in, in the process, right? So you have also key people that can contribute. Do, do you want to comment on that as well, Gabriela? Sí, gracias, Laila. Este, que, yes, como... thank you, Laila. As Lily was saying, we organized several activities. We had a community of practice, a collaborative work, and these were basically workshops. Uh, the methodological tools can be varied. As we had said before, we talked about action, re action research, and also this allows participants to be part of decision making. Also, something I've just remembered, the IAI has established the funding, established the funding process many year, many months before and with a, with a lot of TD work as well. We held a number of workshops before writing the proposal. And um, there we needed the participation of local non-academic participants and this in a way forced us to do something that usually takes a long time because it's not considered in this type of work and this is also important you need to find uh, funders that consider that TD work is essential uh, in project de design thank you Stella and, and Laila the the objectives of this course here right so that people have the time to reflect uh to make contacts and to um recognize the best paths to address the transdisciplinary approach before the actual grant writing and the process of building the project actually uh starts so this is part of the, it's really interesting to have a, a small grants program uh, project as a part of uh, the examples here, also due to the fact that it shows this strain of the AI on, on trying to foster the capacity building onto the transdisciplinary approach, uh, also and not just the, the implementation of transdisciplinary projects, right? So we are one minute to the hour. So the, the, the remaining questions will also be included in the document. Um, so we can uh, uh, at some point offer some feedback to the participants on the, the remaining questions. So I'd like to thank you all so much uh, for coming and hope to see you all on Thursday and keep, keep tuned to the three uh extraordinary activities happening this week and the other and uh to the check-in week next week if you have any further issues that you would like to address please contact your facilitators for the course thank you so much have a really great rest of your day everyone <laughs>